Testing, testing. Humming, humming. If I stand here with one foot, with this tin foil on my head, it doesn't do it. Hey, are we ready? It's after 10. I got a plane to catch. Okay. Oh, wait, I got to get my Tums. Brother John Costick, and we will begin in just a few seconds. <laughs> it's Groundhog Day. And it was, uh, so you're jet lagged, and I was blessed to have an entire row of seats. That's really nice for a 14 hour flight. And I never watch movies on planes, but I thought, you know, let's see what they got. Groundhog Day. I, I've, people were talking about this. So, but I'm so sleepy, and I started watching it, and then I kind of dozed off, and then I woke up, and I thought, oh, I already saw this part. <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to fast forward it, and I no, I already saw this part. And I didn't know what the movie was about. <laughs> and I'd fall asleep, and I'd wake up, and it would be the same. What in the world? <laughs> and years later, I saw the movie, and it all became clear. <laughs> they just kept repeating themselves. Okay. Um, Today we're going to do Elijah and Elisha, in Hebrew, Eliyahu and Elisha. And uh, I, I put this in here just to, to point out that 
the Bible is full of types and antitypes. Okay, you'll see types of Jesus all through the Old Testament. Okay, here uh, you have Isaac and Yeshua. Uh, Isaac, firstborn male, follows his father's instructions. Same with Yeshua. Isaac is a substitute. Uh, is, can you go back one? I don't think this is the first slide. Well, again, back, back. Okay, that's the first thought. Maybe there. Is there more behind it? No, that's the first one then. Abraham offered his son Isaac as a sacrifice. God offered his son Yeshua as a sacrifice. Okay. Uh, Isaac follows his father's instructions willingly. Willingly, that's important. By the way, your sacrifice had to be two things. It had to be innocent, and it had to be willing. Those are very important. That's why a lamb, a lamb is kind of willing. It doesn't realize it's about to die. It's not screaming and blah, blah, blah. You know, I don't want to die. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, it didn't become, it was willing at any point. Because a lamb. Oh, well, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. They, they lived with it for four days. And it <laughs> so it has to be willing and it has to be innocent. Okay. And uh, it's nice that uh, Isaac willingly followed his father's instructions. Next. Um, for Isaac, a, a substitute blood sacrifice is provided, the ram with horns caught in the thorn bush, and Yeshua becomes our sacrifice uh, substitute, and he appears in the middle of the thorn, crown of thorns, uh, which, which points out that, you know, when God came to see Moses on Mount Sinai, or when he was a fire in a thorn bush. So where does God show up with Moses? In a thorn bush. And then with Abraham and Isaac, Isaac, the substitute, shows up in a thorn bush. So when they put that crown of thorns on Jesus, it's showing that he's God. He's in the thorn bush, like the fire. And he's the substitute, like he was with Isaac's the ram. Okay. Uh, next. Yes. Yeah, they both carried the wood to their sacrifice. Yeah. I, I've got a three-hour talk on this. It's called the Akida, uh, the binding of Isaac. Go to YouTube and watch it. It goes through every little detail. Um, Joseph is a parallel. Betrayed by his brothers, sold for 20 pieces, falsely accused, sentenced to death slash prison. He had a baker and a cupbearer. He had bread and wine. Uh, he was raised to number two, both of them. Uh, they both marry a Gentile bride. Okay. So I'm just pointing out antitypes. Okay. Because that's what Elijah and Elisha are going to represent. Um, and this verse, I didn't, I didn't move this slide to later in the show, <laughs> but uh, I should have, and I will when we film it, but pay attention to this verse because I'll, I'll make note of it or make mention of it later. Um, I will raise up a prophet, this is God telling Moses, I will raise up a prophet from their countrymen like you, Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. This is how the Jews are supposed to know who the Messiah is going to be. He's going to be the prophet who is from among their countrymen, so he's a prophet, he's Jewish, and he's the one who's most like Moses. So when you think of the parallels between Moses and Jesus, what are the parallels? Well, you know, I used to think, well, I, I can think of one. I remember when Moses was born, all the babies, Pharaoh had all the babies thrown in the river, killed. And when Jesus was born, Herod had all the babies killed. Okay, so there's, okay, is there any other ones? 
It turns out when you really start digging into it, here, here's a few that I gathered. They both came up out of a river. They were both rejected by their own and saved foreigners. Uh, they wrote the law in stone or flesh. Um, they lived and died on a cross. You know, Jesus died on a cross. Moses lived on a cross. Remember when they, when they had the camp? It was in the shape of a cross. Uh, yeah, you can go back and watch this and pause it and go through it uh, carefully. But if that's not enough, Here's more. They were both judges, teachers, prophets, priests, and kings. Uh, I have an entire six-hour video. It's broken into five parts, but there's six hours listing all the minute details of these two. Moses. And as they say in the movie, Moses. Was it Yvonne DiCarlo or somebody? She would always pronounce it. Drag that out. Uh, here's more. They representation of sin on a pole. Uh, they were the mediator between God and man. Uh, it just went on and on and on. And here's, uh, here's more. <laughs> they both had odd cribs. Moses is in the basket in the river. Jesus is in a manger. I mean, it's just... So you got the point. You can't miss that Jesus has to be the Messiah because he's the one that has, he's the one most like Moses. He's the prophet from among their countrymen most like Moses. This was, give you goosebumps when you watch that video. Okay. Now, so today we're going to talk about Elijah. He was a prophet. Um, who is Elijah, and uh, do we even know much about him? Most people don't. Uh, most people tell you about, oh, there was the big sacrifice up on the hill, and uh, fed by ravens, and they know a couple of tidbits about him, but not much. <coughs> but you really can't uh, not know about him, if, even if you're a, a jump-to-the-back-of-the-book uh, kind of person. Because if you go to the last page of the Old Testament, the last verse, it says he's going to send Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So if you just read the first verse and the last verse, you know Elijah. You may not know much about him, but he's big enough to... Okay? And there's the... Well, we just talked about that one. Okay? And he's going to restore the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children of their fathers. And he won't... Okay. Uh, we're going to skip this because of time. Uh, Elijah, uh, his name is Aleph Lamed, that's El, which is God, and yud Hey, which is Yah. So he's got... It will. <laughs> okay, call the airline, tell them I'm going to be a few minutes late now. <laughs> Guilt, 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 guilt. No, we got time. Don't worry. My plane's not until, I don't know, two something. Uh, okay. Okay, next. So, in his name, it's God is Yah. So, if you're confused, which God? Which God? God is Yah. That's the God. Okay. Uh, Elijah's name appears 71 times in the Tanakh, Old Testament. Uh, there are five times that Elijah's name uh, is missing above at the end. Well, that's kind of odd, you know, because usually it has the above on the end, which is the ooh that Donna was asking about. But there are five times that it doesn't have that above. Now, why? Um, well, let's go back to Genesis 37. It says, uh, and Jacob, and it doesn't matter what it says, but Jacob. Here's Jacob's name. <laughs> I'm just pointing out what, uh, it's Jacob. Here's Jacob's name, Yud Ein Kuf Bet. Okay, next. 
there are five times that Jacob has an extra vav. Well, that's kind of weird. Usually his name is his four letters, but there are five times where it has that extra vav in here. And here are the five times. So, five times Elijah's missing a vav, and five times Jacob has an extra vav. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? The sages say that Elijah is going to return for his missing vav. Because Jacob, he got his name changed to Israel, and so Elijah is coming back to Israel to get his vavs. Okay? I think it's probably deeper than that. Um, and I don't know if I have slides on this or not, but... Uh, you know, Elijah, he's known for, he is just full of the Spirit of God, right? In fact, it's, it's so pronounced that uh, Elisha asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And we know that in the end of days, it says, we know God's going to scatter the Jews all over the planet. And then in the end of days, he's going to bring them back. And he's going to breathe into them this spirit and he's going to take their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh okay so maybe uh elijah's well that's why uh elijah's coming back to give that spirit to jacob to israel okay Now, Elijah bursts on the scene in 1 Kings 17. We don't know much about him prior to this. We don't know nothing about him prior to this. That's the first mention of him. And we shall begin. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. I put a number one there because this is the first miracle that Elijah is going to do. Okay, he's going to stop the rain. And then the word of the Lord came to him saying, notice the word of the Lord came to Elijah. That is going to be huge in this day's talk. Okay, we'll just see how often that happens. And he says, go from here and turn eastward by the brook Cherith, and it shall be that you will drink from the brook, and I've commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So, he gives his first edict, no rain, and then he's told to go by a brook. And, and, it's, and I have commanded, so again, it's, Elijah's not doing anything with the birds, they, it's, they've been commanded by God. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. Uh, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. It happened after a while the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. That was his miracle, no rain. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. You're going to notice that Elijah, as spirit-filled as he is, every move that he makes is from the word of the Lord. That's important for what's coming. Uh, then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs in Sidon, and stay there. I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went there, and he came to the gate of the city. Behold, a widow was gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Bring me some bread in your hand. Oh, word of the Lord came, okay. Uh, this is cool because in Jesus' time, you know, it says here, truly I say, and this is Jesus in uh, Luke 4, uh, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown, uh, but I say to you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months. 
when a great famine came over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of the widows in Israel, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. That's interesting that Jesus brought that point up. It was brought up in the New Testament. It's referring to the Elijah story. Of all the people, Jesus, there was a lot of widows in Israel at the time of Jesus. But he never went to any of them. He went to this foreign Gentile. Make sense? And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha. And none of them were cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Elisha, we're going to talk about also today, because Elijah, Elisha. And lots of lepers in Israel. Elisha didn't heal any of them. He went to the Gentile and healed. So that's interesting that both Elijah and Elisha didn't heal any of their own. They were healed foreigners. That's kind of a picture of what Jesus, right? He came for the lost sheep of Israel. They didn't want him. So he turned to the Gentiles and a few Jews. <laughs> Deborah's back there. Hmm? I don't know what that is. It could be. Uh, next. Okay. Now he asked this woman for food. She said, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread. Only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. She must have my mother's cookbook. She'll admit it. She don't like to cook. <laughs> then Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go, do as you have said. But make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me, and afterward you may make one for yourself and your son. Thus the Lord says, uh, thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be ex exhausted, nor the jar of oil empty until the day the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. Miracle number two, the, the flour and oil don't run out. She did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, and the oil did not become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. There again, according to the word of the Lord, everything Elijah does is from the word of the Lord. It comes about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And he, the son of the woman. And, uh, uh, and his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to bring me my iniquity to my remembrance and to put my son to death. He said, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom and carried him up the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. So he's, he's with his family, right? You don't understand what's happening. Kid dies. He called to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I'm staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times, and he called to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, my God, I pray you let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him, and he was revived. Miracle number three. We're, we're counting up to eight. That's how many Elijah did. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper room, gave him to his mother, and said, See, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is truth. It happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. Everything is, everything is by the word of the Lord. And we're going to just save time. Uh, he's supposed to go talk to Ahab. So Ahab and Obadiah. King Ahab wants Elijah dead. Because Ahab knows that Elijah is the one who stopped the rain. It's been three and a half years, no rain. So Ahab and Obadiah 
uh, goes search for him. They fi Obadiah finds him, and Obadiah arranges a meeting between Elijah and Ahab. We just saved 10 minutes, because that's about a chapter and a half. Obadiah, Obed, Obediah. Obed, anyone know what Obed means? Obed is a servant. And then you have Obadiah, servant of God. Okay? And uh, in, in the Arabic, you'll hear Abdullah. You, uh, ab, abed, Obed, Allah. Ob, Abedallah. It's the servant of Allah. So it's the same name in Arabic. When Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? Elijah says, I'm not a troubler of Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you followed the Baals. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel on Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Okay, we're coming to the big showdown on Mount Carmel. I went to Carmel a couple of years ago, and I don't know if you've been there. It's, they got a big Catholic church. They got a big statue of Elijah, and they charge you to get in. And I told the guy, I'll wait in the parking lot. My friends, if they want to go in, they can go in. And I stood there in the parking lot. How awful to charge somebody to go in. Shame on you. A pox upon you. So Ahab sent a messenger among all the sons of Israel, and they brought the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450. Now let them give us two oxen, and let them choose one ox for themselves and cut it up, place it on the wood, put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, yud hey vav hey, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, good idea. It is a good idea. So Eliyahu said to the prophets of Baal, choose one ox for yourself and prepare it for you, our, uh, prepare it first for you, our many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire. They took the ox, uh, they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon. O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, no one answered, and they leapt about uh, the altar which they made. At about noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Call out with a loud voice, for he is God. Maybe he's occupied or gone inside or he's on a journey. Perhaps he's asleep and needs to be awakened. <laughs> Maybe he's in the toilet. <laughs> you know, it's, it's nice, to, it's good to mock, it's fun, it's fun, that's what, it's fun to mock false gods. As long as you're not in a country where they'll kill you. <laughs> but you know what? I kind of do it anyway. I may not go on the town square and do it, but with the host that I'm with, I do it. Okay. Next. So they cried with a loud voice, and they cut themselves according to their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out of them. When midday was passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. There was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. There was no. Yeah. Uh, then Eliyahu said to the people, come near. So all the people came near, and he prepared the altar of the Yahweh, which had been torn down. Eliyahu took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes, uh, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the 12 stones, he built an altar in the name of Yahweh, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. And notice here we also have, to whom the word of the Lord had come. That's a recurring thing, isn't it? The word of the Lord is coming to Elijah for everything. 
He arranged the wood and cut the ox in pieces and laid it on the wood. He said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering on the wood. He said, do it a second time. He said, do it a third time. So that's 12 pitchers of water he put on there. And the water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the evening sacrifice, Eliyahu the prophet came near and said, Yahweh, the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are the Elohim in Israel, and that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Yahweh, answer me that this people may know that you, Yahweh, are Elohim, and that you have turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench and the stones. Let me repeat that. (laughs) That was number four, miracle. We're halfway. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, Yahweh, he is Elohim, but Yahweh, he is God. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Eliyahu brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slew them there. Now Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. So this is miracle number five. He's called the rain back. Ahab went up to eat and drink, but Elijah went at the top of Mount Carmel and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. He said to his servant, go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go back seven times. No rain, no rain, seven times. It came about the seventh time that he said, behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. He said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down so that the heavy shower does not stop you. In a little while, the sky grew black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy shower and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. That's miracle five, bringing the rain back. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. He outran a chariot. Amazing there. That's five. I, I, I had five. Five showed up on two slides. Okay. Go back one. Go back one. Go back two. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, that's number six. You're going forward. Does anybody know the difference between forward and backwards? Because we need a new... <laughs> Don't, don't, bite, don't bite the hand that feeds. <laughs> <laughs> That's Carolyn. <laughs> I will not bite Carolyn's hand. <laughs> okay. All right, I don't know where we are now. Uh, <laughs> you got to go back. There's two. There's two arrows right down at the right there. Back. Okay, go back. You're going the wrong way again. (laughs) Five. So that's five. Right. And, uh, yeah, 46 is going to be, yeah. That would be number six. Okay. Um, Now, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Eliyahu, saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So Jezebel, that's Ahab's wife, she said, By tomorrow you're going to be dead like all those prophets. And Elijah was afraid. And rose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, 
It is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. Uh, unbelievable. I mean, he's, he's doing all these incredible miracles, and he's afraid of this Jezebel? A woman. I know some women I'd be afraid of. <laughs> so, uh, okay, next. He lay down and slept under the juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. He looked, and behold, there was a, about his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, Arise, eat, because the journey is great for you. He arose, ate and drank, he went in the, with the, and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Horeb is the same as Sinai. It just has two different names, okay? Which is kind of interesting that he's going to spend 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai, Horeb. And he's not going to be eating. He, had, he ate the bread and water before he went there. Who else spent 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai without any food and water? Moses. Right? So you have, that's a, that's a pretty big parallel between Moses and Elijah. And we have them, those are the two who show up on the Mount of Transfiguration, right, in the New Testament. And those are the two who are going to be the witnesses in Revelation, Elijah and Moses. Horeb. Yes. Okay, next. Uh, then he came there to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword, and I alone am left and they seek my life to take it away. Notice, this is everything we've read so far. Go to the next one. Seven times the word of the Lord came to Elijah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. And we, we could have guessed that, right? How many times did the word of the Lord came to Elijah? You just, anytime you, anybody asks you biblically, how many times, seven, just say seven and beat everybody else with the answer. Because probably, you're probably going to be right. So seven times the word of the Lord came to Elijah. And he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And before the Lord was passing by. And a great and strong wind was rending, tearing the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But Yahweh was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. Isn't it interesting? We, we sometimes pray and ask God for something. And we're expecting an earthquake or a hurricane or a fire. We're waiting for the answer. And sometimes the answer just comes from the door. You know? So we should realize that and, and be listening for it. Because you just can't... Deborah, Deborah said a prayer uh, for me this week that within the next week, I get somebody to help me do the videos. It's been three days. I've, there's no earthquake. I've not seen a fire, and I've not uh, had a hurricane. But I need to be listening carefully for the answer to that prayer. And maybe you all can pray that for me also. Okay, next. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Then he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. 
The Lord said, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you have arrived, you shall anoint. Look, he's going to give him a list of things to do. When you arrive, you will anoint Hazael, king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall appoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of, okay, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. You know what just happened right there? Elijah got demoted. You know, this is what happens. Elijah has all these incredible miracles, and then he's afraid, and he runs to a cave, and God's like, next, you know? And as we read on, you're going to find that it doesn't show any record of him appointing these kings. But he does go and appoint Elisha, Elijah, to be, uh, the Jews say Elisha, um, his successor. Um, and it shall come about the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu will put to death. And the one who escapes from Jehu, Elisha will put to death. Yet I leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees who have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You know, a lot of times we think, oh my goodness, God... I'm the only one left. Nobody else gets it. And he's got 7,000 out there who get it, you know. So don't think you're the only one. There are others. Okay, so here is the demotion. He's going to go. You, and that's got to be a hard thing. When you realize God's no longer supporting you, he, and, and you got to go... Train the guy who's taking your place. Not train him, but inform him and whatever. That's just, yeah. Yeah, Joshua and Moses. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, uh, while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him. And he was with the 12th. And Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. So, here's 12 pair of oxen. That's a pair, two, three, 12 pair. I, that's how I first pictured it. He's, I'm thinking, how tough is this ground <laughs> that you would need 12 pair of oxen in a row to get this plow through it? Are you plowing a parking lot, a concrete parking lot? You know. So this is probably not how it, how it was. It's probably more like this. And so he departed from there and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, while he was plowing with 12 pair of oxen before him. Okay? And he with the 12th. Here's Elijah, or Elisha, and he's with the 12th. That must mean... He's got other people. Oh, and he threw his mantle over him. Okay. And that means he had other guys working the other plows. Because there's no way he can control 12 by himself. And that tells me something. It tells me that Elisha, Elisha is humble. He doesn't mind rolling up his sleeves and getting down in the dirt with his employees and plowing with them. He can't plow all 12 by himself. Okay? So Elisha is humble. Um, so Elisha left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please, let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elijah, he's got a kind of a smart aleck re response, because he's not real happy because he's just lost his prophet position. So he returned from him and took the pair of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the implements of the oxen, and gave it to the people, and they ate, 
Then he arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. That's, that's extremely prophetic. Look what Elisha, Elisha does. And I think we'll talk about this in the future. In here. But he kills all the oxen. He burns all the plows. And he feeds the people with them. What did Elijah do with his oxen? Elijah had oxen up on Mount Carmel. And he called for fire. The fire came down. Poof. Did anybody eat? No, the stones got burned up. So Elijah, Elijah did a sacrifice. It all went to God. Nobody ate. Elisha, everybody ate. There's a difference. Okay? And they both did, sac not a sacrifice really, but they both had fire involved. And Okay. <coughs> We also must know and, and assume that Elisha is wealthy. If he's got 12 pair of oxen that he can afford to kill them and let everybody eat, he got some coins. So he returned from following, uh, and he gave it to the people when they ate, and he rose and followed Elijah. Um, there, I don't know even what to do with this slide. They both sacrificed, maybe this is what I just talked about also. They both sacrificed them. Uh, Elijah, he had 12 stones involved. He had 12 waters. He had one ox, totally consumed. He had 12 ox, he had 24 oxen, and totally consumed by the people. So consumed by God, consumed by people. Right? And there's 12 involved in both of them. Uh, and this goes back to Leviticus. Uh, I think what uh, a burnt offering is when, when it gets burned up and <laughs> everything goes to God, you don't get to eat any of it. Right? That's a picture of what's happened here. By the way, I have a talk. We've never done it here, I don't think. No, we haven't done this one. The, there's the sacrifices of... Did we do the sacrifices? Okay. But one of them was the burnt offering. And the burnt offering, there is a little asterisk there. The priest gets to keep the skins. So whenever you do a burnt offering, you kill the animal, you skin it, and then you, everything else gets burned up. But the priest gets to keep the skins for his trouble. I think that Genesis 3, when it says, And God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them, I think God was doing a burnt offering. God was the priest. He, was, he had to kill an animal. He gets to keep the skins, which he gave to Adam and his wife and the rest was a burnt offering. Why not? I don't think so. No, I, 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 don't, I don't think it was, I don't, I don't picture it as skin. I don't know why. It's like a polyester blend is what I'm picturing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Huh? <laughs> okay, next. Yeah, see this here. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust. That was miracle four. Everything poof, goes. Versus Elisha, who feeds the people. Okay, what's this? Uh, now Moab. Okay, now we're in Second Kings. Moab rebelled against Israel at the death of, ah death of Ahab, and Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber, which was in Samaria, and became ill. 
I don't know who Ahaziah is. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go, inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I will recover from this sickness. Well, that's not good. If you're a Jew and you get sick, should you instruct your messengers to go inquire of Baal Zebub? Problem there. Okay, just keep that in mind. But the angel of the Lord had said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, It is because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. Is that why you're going to, to ask Beelzebub because there's no God in Israel? Right? What are you doing? Psst. Now therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the... This is... This is the instruction that the king's getting. You will not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you will surely die. Then Elijah departed. Bad news. That's not him. That's bad news on the doorstep. When the messengers returned to them, uh, to him and said to them, Why have you returned? They said to him, A man came up to meet us and said to us, Go return to the king who sent you. Uh, and say to him, thus says the Lord, is it because there's no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore you will not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you will surely die. And this always gets... I mean, this is like a quote in a quote in a quote in a quote. <laughs> so the king gets the bad news. He's going to die. He said, what kind of man was this who came up to meet you and spoke these words? They answered him, he was a hairy guy with a leather girdle around his loins. And he said, that's Elijah the Tishbite. I mean, he, yeah. Um, and notice Elijah had a leather girdle around his waist for whatever that might come up later. Um, then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50. So he sent 50 men to Elijah. And he went up to him, and behold, he, Elijah was sitting on top of the hill. And he said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. And Elijah answered, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. on miracle number six well, yeah well the chariot was right five b or yeah i'm not or maybe you know what maybe the rain maybe the chariot chariot was was sit five and the and the 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 rain coming back is really is not a miracle because he said at the beginning he said I'm going to close up the rain for three and a half years, so bringing the rain back isn't really a miracle. You, it was part of miracle one where you're going to right. Uh, so again he sent another captain of fifty, and he said, "O man of God, thus says the king, come down quickly." Elijah says, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Miracle 7. So again, uh, so he again sent the captain of a third 50 with his 50. <laughs> yeah, I would not want to be... <laughs> <laughs> what is wrong with us? Well, I think the tape has got pushed that way uh -huh. because then you kind of go, I don't know. That may not be it because you're still going to do it. Oh, it may be him trying to say it. Oh. <laughs> so again, he sent the captain of the third 50. When the third captain of the 50 went up, he came and bowed down on his knees before Elijah. Yeah. A good move. 
Yep. Uh, and he begged him and said to him, O man of God, please let my life and the lives of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the first two captains of the 50 and their 50s, but now let my life be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, Go down with him, do not be afraid. So he arose and went down with him to the king. Yeah, you know, you, that was just, he went in bowing, you know, and he lived. God bless him. Uh, I think we may have jumped. <laughs> I, go back. Wait. I'm saying I'm confused. What, what verse was it? Now him do not, yeah, so that's 15. Now next. Then he said to him, Thus says uh, the Lord, Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, is it because there is no god in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore you shall not come down from your bed where you have gone up. You will surely die. Yehoran reigns over Israel. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord which Elijah had spoken. And because he had no son, Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Now the rest of the Acts, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? Okay, so that kind of finishes up that. And now chapter 2 Kings 2. It came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So Elisha, some, Elijah must have known he's going to be taken up or he's gonna, something's going to happen. And Elijah said to Elisha, because Elisha is his new assistant, right? He's following him. He's a shadow. Elisha said to Elisha, Elijah uh, said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel. What does Bethel mean? House of, House of God. Yeah, El is God. Bethlehem is house of bread. When the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you, from over you today? And he said, yes, I know, be still. Well, that's interesting that the, the people of this town knew that God was about to take Elijah. So it's not a, not a secret that this was about to happen. These are, I think I have a, uh, I did this talk in India, and I think I have another PowerPoint without all those, my notes in it. Should we change it, or just fast forward them? We're okay. Okay, Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, as the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master over you today? And he answered, yes, I know. Be still. Then Elijah said to him, please stay here. For as the Lord has sent me to the Jordan, he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. So Elisha is like glue to Elijah. Now, 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, so that the two of them crossed on dry ground. That's pretty impressive. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Well, that's a nice thing to ask. Now, if I'm Elijah, and if someone asks me, Hey, John, can I have a double portion of your spirit? Listen, I don't have the power to grant this. Right? You know, that's above my pay grade. So, that's an odd request. 
And Elijah's got to come back with some kind of an answer to let him know, it's not, not, not up to me. He said, you've asked your hard thing. Nevertheless, this is the best answer. If you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. So Elijah's now leaving it up to God. If, if you see me go, may you get that. If you don't see me go, tough. As they were going along talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah whoosh, went up in a whirlwind to heaven. So he saw him go. So we can assume he's going to get a double portion of his spirit. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his clothes and tore them in two pieces. Kind of reminds me a little bit of the, my God, my God, my father, my father. Or in the modern texting Bible, you know, in the, in the King James, it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In the texting Bible, it says, OMG, OMG, where are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't text, so. <laughs> okay, we got to do something about that because it's driving me insane. Huh? I understand, but why is it humming every time I move? You already said this. Yep. So if you don't go as close to the table, I think you're. Okay. I think. But don't get in front of the tree. Yeah, don't get in front of that. I'm not. I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> like a prisoner here. Um, now, this is kind of cool. Okay, he saw it. He cried out, my father, my father. And he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his clothes and he tore them in two pieces. This is, Elisha did this. That tearing, that is going to represent, what do we call it? A sea change, a paradigm shift, something big now. Uh, there's a it's, there's a new a new king in town, a new prophet in town. You understand that Elijah was the old, out with the old. Now it's something new is coming. Elisha is coming. That tearing that was a important thing. Yes. Uh, yeah, and that, and that is the, the moment things changed, right? Prior to that, you had to sacrifice animals and give them to the priest and all this. And now after that, the, the veil was rent, you can go boldly into the throne of God. Right. But I don't know if that applies here. Because Elisha's tearing his garment. Well, Amos it's says during the burning bush, talking about the burning bush. I mean, that's where the mm -hmm. spirit, you know, the interior of the anointing. Yeah. So the tear Well, I have him tearing it to show there is, there is a difference between these two guys. That's old school. That's new school. No, that's old school. Right. That's new school. Oh, look at that. We got all the, we have the veil, so I already even thought of that. <laughs> this was six months ago I put this together, so I haven't looked at it much lately. Okay, next. Elijah represents the prophets. Elisha is going to represent the new covenant. The Brit Hadashah, right? Old and the new. 
Uh, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Violent men take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. So even John the Baptist, he's the greatest of all the prophets. But after him, there's that place where the, the veil tore. And now John the Baptist is old school. Jesus is new school. Okay? You can see a parallel here. Elijah is old school. And we know Elijah is John the Baptist. Not literally, right? I mean, type, thank you. Um, so, it stands to reason if Elijah is John the Baptist, then Elisha will be a Jesus type. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking for now. That makes sense, yes? Uh, where? I just, yeah, I don't know. Just showing you the Tanakh. <laughs> okay, the last verse of the Tanakh, I, I think it was just to show you that the, uh, I don't know. If I, come, if I come up with something, I'll let you know. We know that the last verse of Malachi says, the last verse of the whole Old Testament, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So it's prophesied that this Elijah is going to come. Okay. Uh, next. Ah. You know, I don't know who these people are, so... Can we cut to the live feed for a moment? Don't put this one up. Uh, or just take, that, just take the slide down and just come back to me live. Okay. Yeah, this is for y'all and it's not for, okay. I've been to Passover Seders and I just stole this one off of it so some poor family, they're being broadcast all over the world. Yeah. Um, but this is a Jewish family that's having a Passover Seder. And you'll notice that there is an empty chair here. And there's a glass of wine poured. And maybe it's the guy who's taking the picture. But I think he sits here. <laughs> and this is, they're saving that seat for Elijah. Because the last verse of the Old Testament says, I'm going to send Elijah so the Jews are preparing. And on Passover, <coughs> they set an empty place for him. Do you guys have Passover Seder here? You do, don't you? Yeah. Do you set a place for him? Yes, okay. You set a place for me? Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, and you know, I had a, a, a Jewish neighbor, uh, Frida. I think she's passed now. Uh, you know, they had to put her in a home for a bit, and she kind of disappeared. But I've known her for years, and uh, Frida was 94. And she said when she was a little girl, they would send her, hey, Frida, go look outside and see if, if uh, Elijah's coming. And she was scared to death. It's kind of like the kids at Christmas, you know. <laughs> we go to my grandmother's and then on Christmas Eve, and they say, hey, kids, go out and look on the path, see if uh, Santa Claus is coming, you know. And we'd be all scared to maybe it actually show up, be out there. And she was just kind of the same way, thinking, what if I go out there and this guy's coming down the street? What do I do? And the little kid Think about it. If you're 10 years old, if you're 12, your whole life, every year, your family is expecting this guy, whoever he is, to the degree that they're setting a place for him and pouring this wine, they're expecting, this little kid's expecting someone to actually show up. Right? Yeah. It's, not a, it's not a religious thing. Right. It's a real thing. Right. Hey, go see if he's out there. Hey, we've got a place for him. You know? 
So she she was doing it 100 years ago. All right. This is a picture I found on the internet of Jewish kids looking to see if Okay, so we know he's coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Uh I think about four slides back, five slides back. Let me just show you. Can we back, 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 back? Last year. Keep going. Again, again. Uh, that's it right there. Uh, look at that last verse, how it ends. <laughs> Behold, Behold, huh? <laughs> It, with a trumpet blast. <laughs> Where's the nearest trash can? That's your husband. Oh, by okay, I'm sorry. Yes. 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 No, I don't speculate. It's Moses. <laughs> and here's, we know it's Elijah's for sure. Because of this verse. The other, here's how I know for sure it's Moses. And we've got, I'm going to do this in two minutes. Whenever Moses goes up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, and there's the burning bush, okay? And the first thing God says is, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Then God says, I've heard your pleas, and I'm going to save your people. And Moses brings up his, his, his he has a, um, a, 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 a speech, 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 speech impediment. And then, of all things that could come out of Moses' mouth, and think of this is the. This is a huge thing, right? He's God Almighty in a burning bush talking to you. And you say to the bush, you know, they're going to ask me, what is your name? What do I tell them? That's an odd thing to ask. And of all the things he could say right there, that's what he said. And God had that recorded in the book. And then God said, I am that I am. You tell them Yahweh of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Moses goes down the mountain. He's got the tablets. He goes on with the Torah. And he goes all the way until he dies at the end of whenever, Deuteronomy. You know what? Never did the Jews ask Moses, hey, by the way, what was his name? If they didn't ask, and God took all the effort to put that in the book. That means they're going to ask. And if they didn't ask then, they're going to ask then, in the future, when he comes back as one of the witnesses. That'll be $3. That's pretty strong. Glenn. I think he's coming back as one of the witnesses. That's, those two witnesses are coming back to Jerusalem. That's the coming back. John the Baptist was a coming back, maybe a spiritual coming back. And Eli uh, the actual Elijah is coming back as a 
flesh and bone, real physical coming back. Say again? Yes. Yeah, that's a big event later. Well, I'm not sure he died the first time. Okay. <laughs> I cannot. Because I got a plane to catch and we got more. Yeah. Yeah, that's another point. We are the two witnesses of the God of, of Yahweh. Yeah. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. So. Yeah, and a lot of people want to put Enoch in there as the Gentile and Moses as the Jew. But maybe Elijah, not maybe, Elijah is the Gentile and Moses is the Jew. So he's coming back, the witness is coming back for everyone. Yes. My point is this, um, that, he, that Elijah is going to come back and he's going to restore the father, the children, children of the father, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Isn't that interesting? The last word of the Old Testament is curse. That's kind of big. Okay. Yeah, Malachi is the last. Yep. Okay, now let's jump ahead to where we were. And again, again, again. Uh, I will not come with a curse. That's the last verse of the Tanakh. Next. Uh, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. So that's the last word of the Old Testament is curse. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. I hope I have this here. I do. God bless. Thank you, God. Okay. Look at the word, the last word of the Tanakh. Here's the last, here's that Malachi 4, 6. Here's the word curse. It's cherem, cherem, chet, resh, mem. What do you notice about that word cherem? What's it end with? A final mem. Go to the next one, please. Do I hope? It's, it ends with a final mem. Remember, if, if it's the last letter, here's a mem. If it's the last letter, you use that mem. Okay. Well, what is, remember what mem represents, water chaos. and chaos. There's a mem. It's water, chaos, mem. Remember, we're going to bring a little sex into every one of these talks. Remember that mem also represents an open womb with a birth canal or a closed womb. Isn't it interesting that the Old Testament ends with a closed womb? The last letter of the Old Testament, closed womb. And then you turn the page. Oh, here it is. The last word of the Tanakh is curse. The last letter of the Tanakh is a closed mem. And you turn the page, and it's the book of the genealogy of Yeshua HaMashiach, son of David, son of Abraham. So that closed mem, that, that closed womb, unimportant, because he's going to do a virgin birth if you turn the page. That's nice. Hmm? Bonanza. <laughs> and here is the Matthew telling, right? Okay. Uh, next. John the Baptist. Uh, next. His birth. Uh... And we did a, a talk on this. Uh, it's on one of my videos. But in the days of Herod, uh, there was a priest named Zacharias, division of Abia, his wife, uh, daughter of Aaron. Her name is Eli Shabbat. Eli Shabbat is Eli Shabbat. Uh, El is God. Shabbat is rest. 
Elizabeth means God is my rest. Okay. Uh, I'll go back one just to see. It's. I know. L. L is Elohim. Yod stands for Yahweh. So that's why I have Yahweh Elohim is rest. That's what that Yod represent. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, angel appeared. Uh, Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel. Do not be afraid. Your petition has been heard. You'll have a son. You'll give his name John. Uh, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Uh, he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord. So remember, the, Mal uh, the end of Malachi, Elijah is going to return the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons of the father. So you have John who's going to turn many of the sons of Israel. Okay. Uh, Look, it even says, it is, he who will, will, uh, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. I mean, there's right in your face. John the Baptist is going to have this spirit of Elijah to turn back the hearts of the fathers, back to the children. Okay. And Malachi said that's going to happen. Uh... Let's see. Uh, the, Mary arose and went to the hill country, entered the house of Zacharias, and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she cried out in a loud voice, Blessed are you among women. Okay, so Mary was already... Uh, Mary is pregnant six months. Mary is six months behind Elizabeth. Okay. Uh, when Elizabeth heard... yeah. Uh, when it was time for Elizabeth to give birth, she gave birth to a son. Okay. Uh, on the eighth day, they circumcised a child. No, no, no. His name is John. They were all astonished. I, I have... No, it's, it's John the Baptist. Uh, I don't have the calendar in there. But you know what? It's, it was that first verse that says, there was a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abia. What does that even mean? That's the, import, that's the key to everything. The division of Abia, if you go back to Chronicles, I don't remember if it's first or second, but it's like verse, uh, chapter 24. David, when he was setting up the priesthood, all these priests wanted to serve in the temple and, or the tabernacle. And, and they, David said, you know what? I don't need everybody serving at once. So I'm going to divide you guys up. There were 24 of them. You, you're going you're gonna, to uh, serve Jehoiakim or Jehoiakim, I forget his name. But you're going to do the first week. You, he drew lots. It was random. You're going to, the second week. You will do the third week. And it started at Passover. That's the year it began. Or at Abib. So this guy does the first week. This guy does the second. When they go through all 24 weeks, then they repeat. And that takes care of 48 weeks in the year. But everybody works Passover, everybody works Shavuot, and everybody works Sukkot. That co covers 51 weeks. Jewish calendar has 51 weeks. It's a very clever plan to use the 24 priests. And the eighth guy who got picked was Abiyah. So... When does Abiyah do his thing? Abiyah, his week is right after Shavuot. Because it's the first week is right before Passover, right? And then the second week, and then it's Passover, everybody works. 
then the third guy, then the fourth guy, now you're into kind of May, the fifth guy, the sixth guy, the seventh guy, the eighth guy, now you're into June, that's Shavuot. So we know when Zacharias was in the temple when the angel came to him and said, you're going to have a son. And then Zacharias did his week, and then he went back home to his wife, Elizabeth. And they slept together, and now she's pregnant. And if you start in that third week, or second week of June, third week of June, and add nine months, it comes out that John the Baptist is born on Passover. Well, that's kind of interesting because the Jews are expecting Elijah on Passover, and John the Baptist is born on Passover. Does that make sense? I mean, it's there. And if Jesus is six months, Mary was six months pregnant whenever she, no, Elizabeth was six months pregnant whenever Mary, the baby left, all that happened. Jesus is six months behind him. So if John the Baptist is born on Passover, Jesus is born six months later, which is Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when Yeshua comes to tabernacle with us. Make sense? I mean, it's just there. You can't not see it. <coughs> okay. But that's, that's, that's a point for when Jesus said, John the Baptist was Elijah if you'd have only seen it. I mean, he's, he's fulfilling a lot of Elijah-like stuff coming on Passover. I didn't have slides for any of Okay, um, John the Baptist came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is John the Baptist's message. Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt. Uh, Elijah had a leather belt. Uh, around, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And remember we talked about camel also. Whenever you see camel, that represents Holy Spirit, right? Aleph, Bet, Gimel. The third letter is a Gimel. Gimel is camel. Whenever you see camels, Holy Spirit. Next. Uh, so we can, yeah, they got leather belt, leather belt. There's a parallel. Uh, then the Jerusalem was going out in all Judea around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan, and they confessed their sins. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Uh, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourself, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you, from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. I put this verse in. Well, John the Baptist is in this river baptizing. And what is John the Baptist talking about here? From these stones, God is able to raise up children of Abraham. He's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the hypocritical leaders, right? But if you remember, whenever Joshua brought the people across the, the Jordan River, remember the water parted, and they built, they put 12 stones in an altar in the middle of the Jordan River. and then crossed over. And then later the water kept going. So somewhere in the Jordan River, there's a pile of 12 stones from what Joshua put. And I think that's what he's referring to here. He's saying, like, you brood of vipers, you have, but I say to you, from these stones, what stones? John the Baptist is in the river. These stones that I just stubbed my toe on, the, from those stones, God can raise up that's the stones he's talking about. Okay? Yes, that's where the baptism places. You go to Jerusalem, you know, 
but you can't go across because they have a, 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 a fence there because you're, you're going into Jordan. Yeah. You can look across, and the river's so muddy that you can't see the stones. But they're probably there. Because I think they are there because it says they're there to this day. That was a, a verse it mentioned. Oh, here it is. I should look at this before I teach it, shouldn't I? <laughs> See, Joshua set up 12 stones in the middle of Jordan, a place where the, uh, where the feet of the priests who were carried the ark were standing, and they are there to this day. Those are the stones John the Baptist is referring to. Uh, next. Uh, let's go to next. <laughs> John the Baptist is, is baptizing. Uh, remember him as a father. Ray Stones. Yeah, we, we got to move on here. Because we still have to get to Elisha. And I got to leave soon. Then what should we do? Yeah, John the ba This is some of John the Baptist's message. Ah, John the Baptist... John answered and said to all them, As for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to untie the throng of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's a picture of John the Baptist being a Holy Spirit type. The Holy Spirit never draws attention to himself. Holy Spirit always points to the Jesus, the Son. Uh, next. Baptism, let's say. Uh, okay. Jesus arrived at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized him. John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? Jesus answered, Permit it at this time, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. That's Jesus' first words in Matthew. Which is interesting that First words out of his mouth. Uh, next, next, next. Ah, this is kind of cool. There's a, there's a rhetorical device in writing called a chiasmus. Here's the official definition. A rhetorical or literary device in which words, grammatical constructions, or concepts are repeated in reverse order in the same or a modified form. Okay, you got that? No. So let me give you an example, because it's all through there. It's whenever you repeat something, but turn it backwards, okay? The Sabbath was made for man, and not the man for the Sabbath. You see that a lot in the Bible. God uses that a lot, where he just takes this whatever and turns it backwards and makes a big point, okay? And you will see that here. There's another example. Here's one. This is a more intricate, complex one. No one can serve two masters, for he that will either hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. It's there. Look, these two are the same. You can love one, or he will be devoted to one. That's love, love. He will either hate one, he will despise the other. It's the same, same, the same thing. Serve two masters, God and wealth. Those are the two masters. See how he does this? Okay. You can, once you know they exist, you can start looking for them. So there's one here with Jesus' baptism. First, you have John's proclamation regarding Jesus. Hey, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then Yeshua visits John. Then Jesus is baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Then you have the Holy Spirit, Spirit visiting Yeshua. And then you have the Father's proclamation. Behold, uh, my, my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. So you have that chiasmic structure even in Jesus' baptism here. Uh, 
Mm. Yeah, behold, I, my lo beloved son, whom I am well pleased. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's just a different. This is just a different gospel saying the same thing. Mark says it. Luke says it. Uh, it talks about John. Okay. All right. This is good. Uh, the Word became flesh, dwelt amongst us. We saw His glory. Uh, John testified about Him, crying out, "This was." He of whom I said, he who comes after me was as a higher rank, for he existed before me. Which is interesting, because Jesus was born six months after. He came after me, but he was before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God, only the... Okay, we're going to go to the next one. Aha. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Right? They're asking John the Baptist, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And look at, the, look at look how the conversation goes on. It's a little bit light. I, I, go quickly to the next slide just to see if that lights up. No, go back. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? Well, they're expecting Elijah, right? So they asked, are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? What prophet? Not no. Remember way at the beginning of this talk. The one, yes, I'm going to send a prophet from among your countrymen who is most like you, Moses, and I will put my word, that's the prophet they're looking for. It's not Elijah, they are looking for Elijah, they're also looking for the prophet. Okay? So they're test They're quizzing him, like, who are you? Are you, the, are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not. Are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Are you the, are, they ask, are you the prophet? Right? That's kind of interesting that they, they're trying to figure out who he is, and they went through the Old Testament, all the people they're expecting, they're asking about. Okay? And it, now watch what, they, watch what happens here. And he confessed, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Watch. Uh, next. Okay, so... Are you the Christ? No, he's not the Christ. Are you Elijah? No. That's from that they're looking that. Next. Are you the prophet? He said no. That's because of that verse. I didn't think I had that slide in here, but I do. Okay, so we've exhausted all the possibilities. We, we know that that prophet is the Christ. And what does the word Christ mean? Christ is Greek, it means Messiah in Hebrew. Christ, Messiah, same thing. Which is kind of interesting when the Jew hits their hammer, and their, bam, they hit their thumb. Oh, why do you have to do that that hard to prove the point? <laughs> but whenever they hit their thumb and they say, Jesus Christ, a Jew thinks he's safe. But what he's saying is, Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus is the Messiah. Okay? Christ, Christos, Messiah, Mashiach. It's all the same. <coughs> so they've exhausted all the possibilities. He's not the Christ. He's not Elijah. He's not the prophet. Okay? That's who John the Baptist. Now watch his response here. This is so cool. <coughs> and John... He confessed, <coughs> he confessed, he's not the Christ. And he did not deny, that, that matches up with the second thing that they asked him about. 
He did not deny that he was Elijah. It, it, it doesn't, he's not referring, when he says that, he's not referring to, I, I'm just looking at just the, the structure of this sentence. He can, because they ask about three people. Are you the Christ? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? And John's response in this sentence is, he confessed, he did not deny, but confessed. Uh, go to the next one. He confessed he wasn't the Christ, he did not deny he was Elijah, and he confessed he was not the prophet. It's kind of interesting that that middle one has, he, he put those words in there, he did not deny. Because he is Elijah on a certain level. You know, he's that forerunner, the spiritual forerunner or something. I just thought it was interesting that that, that sentence in 20 says he confessed and did not deny, but confessed. And there were three different things that they were asking him about. And if you put the three things with the three things that he, that, that sentence says, it does kind of line up that that one, he did not deny Elijah. He confessed he's not the Christ. He confessed he's not the prophet, but he did not deny that he was Elijah. Eh, it's a stretch, maybe. All right. I mean, I owe you $3 now. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next. Um, okay, we got to move on quick here because we're running out of time. Next. I know what we're looking for here to get. <laughs> There's, uh, go back a couple of, let's talk about John the Baptist's death. Okay, next. You know, uh, next. No. No, we're going to, we got to get to Elisha. And it's not, I, I have... It's the same story in every gospel. And we said that these are the, that was the break, okay? Next. I think the, the point of this is, when John the Baptist got his head cut off, that was, we skipped over 20 slides explaining the whole death of John the Baptist. Um, when he got his head cut off, that was the same kind of the same point when Elijah went up in the whirlwind. Now there's that tearing, there's that, the old covenant is passed, now we're going into the new covenant, okay? Did it happen at Jesus' death? Yes. Did it also kind of happen whenever John the Baptist, he's done, that's the end of the law. You know, things, things change then. Next, new covenant, yeah, yeah. The veil is torn, major sea change. Uh, I thought, let's, let's list all the, the parallels between John the Baptist and Elijah. Elijah did eight miracles. And I think five should not be rain returns. It should be he outran the chariot. Because the rain returning was actually kind of part of shutting it. It's, it's part of that, yeah. Uh, here's all the John the Baptist miracles. Uh, he had none. <laughs> well, there's no parallel there between these two guys. All right, what else we got? Well, this is good. He had a leather belt. He had a leather belt. Okay, yeah, it's a little weak, but it's there. Leather belts, got it. Um, the Jews are expecting Elijah on Passover. Okay, we already talked about that. 
Um, this, okay, this, we've already explained all this. Abby, uh, here I told you. See, this is Jehoiah Rib. He works this week. He works that week. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Abia works this week, which is Shavuot week. And so John the Baptist is conceived somewhere down here in month three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That's nine months. And a little nine, and it's a little bit longer. Pregnancy is nine and a half. So he has John the Baptist being born right about there. And then Jesus will be born six months later, Sukkot. Jews are expecting Elijah on Passover. John the Baptist was born on Passover. So that matches up. It says, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world... Elijah, O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let, let it be known today that you are the God in Israel. Both of these guys uh, recognize God when they see him or hear him, know of him back. Here, uh, this one is supposed to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And uh, Elijah, O oh Lord, you have turned their hearts back again. So there's both. That's a parallel between them. There are parallels between these two. Don't know why that slide's there. Uh -huh. they, they both recognize God, and they both turn hearts back. Uh, ah. uh. Now, let's go see what it says here. Jesus himself said, if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. So that's... Holy Spirit does not draw attention to himself. Uh, he must increase that I, and I must decrease. Okay. We do have Elijah coming back for his missing vav. Uh, we're going to skip all of these because I didn't like these slides to begin with. Okay. So there are some parallels. Uh, go ahead, next one. This is kind of interesting here. Uh, this is a parallel between them. Here's the gematria values of the Hebrew letters, right? And El Eliyahu, Elijah's name adds up to 52, John, if you take the ordinate values of John's name, Yochanan, John adds up to 52. So Elijah and John, both their names add up to 52. That's kind of uh, another piece of information that maybe they're the same, right? Okay, what else we got? Uh... This is kind of nice. This is not really in, on topic, but Torah adds up to 53. Yeshua adds up to 53 on the ordinate values. And Jesus is the Torah. He is the word. Okay. This is ordinate value. Okay. Where, is the, uh, where does that letter show up in the alphabet? Okay. 1 to 22. <coughs> yep. Yeah, seen this one next. <coughs> Okay, we're really going to have to just, because let's get to Elijah, Elisha. I know we got five minutes. Well, we'll go back and back and back. That's miracle number one. Okay, uh, next. What was the first one? Go back, we're going to get the first miracle. That's the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. 
Back. 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 Oh, I'll tell you what the first miracle is. Go back to word number two. Yeah, whenever, whenever Elijah goes up, his mantle is lying on the ground, and Elisha picks up the mantle. He walks over to the river. He uses the mantle and touches the water, and the Jordan parts. There's miracle number one for Elisha. Okay, next. Uh, number two, there was... Uh, Bring a new jar. Okay. Uh, the water was bad. And Elisha said, bring me a new jar and put salt in it. And he poured the water in the spring, and uh, the waters became purified. That's miracle number two for Elisha. Uh, then I love, this is the strangest verse in the Bible. I don't know if it's strange, or it's just, it's just an odd one. Elisha, Elisha went up from there to Bethel, and he was going on the way, and some young lads come out of the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And when he looked behind him and saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and tore up 42 lads by their number. Or of their number. That's just an odd... What is that verse even rep talking about? It's when they're saying go up, bald head go up bald head these lads knew what happened with elijah <coughs> he went up in a chariot of fire and so they're kind of mocking and saying hey baldy why don't you go up with your buddy elijah go up old bald head that's what he's that's what they're referring to and and he Curse them, and bears come out and maul them to death. Don't mess with God's anointed. Don't mess with God's anointed. And this anointed guy might have a double portion. We don't know that. He asked for it, and he may be getting it. We're going to see if he gets it or not. So there's three. Number four, uh, you shall not see wind or rain, uh, and the valley will be filled with water. So he, he does kind of a rain thing there. Um, uh, this is where uh, somebody was, uh, didn't have much to food, and Elisha told them, go and get as many pots and pans from all your neighbors, and, and your little bit of flour will multiply, and it just filled and filled. Okay, so they multiplied the f food. Five. Uh, and that person that Elisha was with prophesied that next year you will have a son, no, no, and a woman conceived and bore a son. That's miracle six. Uh, and then that son died, and Elisha returned and walked in the house and went up and stretched himself and sneezed on the kid seven times, and the kid came back to life. That's miracle number seven, Elisha. There was some stew that was, had poison in it. They had gone out and picked some wild berries or leeks or whatever and put in this pot, and it was, people were dying from eating it, and he healed the stew. Okay, he went and, I forget what he put in it, but it healed it, and they could eat it. That's number eight. Uh, number nine, now that's a big one. What's this one? Uh, oh, this is nice. Oh, this is nice. Look here. A man came from this big town and brought a man of God bread of the first fruits. 20 loaves of barley, keep that in mind, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in a sack. He said, give them to the people that they may eat. His attendant said, what? Well, I set this before 100 men. But he said, give them to the people that they may eat, and they shall eat and have some left over. So he set it before them, and they ate and had left over according to the word of the Lord. That's number nine. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? That's the feeding of the 5,000. Okay. Now, watch. I told you Elisha, Elisha is a Jesus type, right? Elijah, John the Baptist. Who follows Elijah? Elisha. Who follows John the Baptist? Jesus. And remember how we were stressing at the beginning where it says, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. 
It said it seven times. You will never see that with Elisha. The word of the Lord does not come to Elisha. Elisha speaks as if he's the Lord. Do you get that? Do I need to say it again? Because that's really huge. That's why I stress so many times the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Elisha, he doesn't need the word of the Lord coming to him. He is the Lord in type. So he, he called those, the, he cursed those kids. The bears come out and mauled them to death. The word of the Lord didn't come to Elisha to curse the kids. He speaks as if he has the authority, as if he is the, the Jesus type. Who? Elisha's son? Did Elisha have a son? Probably Samuel. Samuel. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but notice this feeding miracle. Look at the feeding miracle. It was a large crowd. Yep, yep. They were seated on the grass. Yep, yep. They were in groups of 50 and 100. That's kind of cool. With, with Elisha, there were 100 guys. And Jesus had him sit in groups of 50 and 100. Okay? Uh, he fed the people with bread made from barley. One of, the, one of the accounts in the New Testament, they were barley loaves that Jesus used. And it said, Elisha, it was barley loaves. And they had food left over. My big point is, Elisha is a Jesus type. So their miracles are going to be really close, okay? Uh, here, see, in John 6, there was a lad here who has five barley loaves. It was barley. They gathered left over. Um, number 10, Elisha sent a messenger saying, go wash the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored. That was healing uh, a leper. Okay. Go dip seven times in the Jordan. You know, I had, a, I had an uncle who had something wrong. I, I, I forget. And it was kind of a chronic thing that went on and on and on and I said, you know what? I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you this right now. In the name of Yahweh, if you have faith, you go down to the Yakagani River and you dip that foot in that river seven times and you will be healed. In the name of Yahweh. Did my uncle do it? No. He was kind of smirked and maybe even kind of half mocked. You know, he had no... But if he would have done it, I think he would have been healed. Because we, caught, we declared it in the name of Yahweh. And let me tell you, I've never done that before. I just, uh, he was just complaining and moping and complaining. And uh, I know he wouldn't get him on a plane to Israel to use the Jordan. But it didn't matter. If you do it in the name of Yahweh, go. But he didn't have faith enough to go do it in the Yakagani River in Pennsylvania. But had he it would have been healed. Uh, therefore, the leprosy of Naaman, oh, he, he, he took the le leprosy of one guy and put it on another because the guy had, uh, uh, I can't explain it. Yeah. Yeah, he, he tried to get money from a miracle. And uh, so he put that leprosy on him. There's number 11. By the way, only three people in the Bible cure leprosy. Who cures leprosy? Let's see. Moses, for sure. Okay? And the one who follows Elijah. Who follows Elijah physically? Elisha. Who follows Elijah spiritually. 
spiritually is John the Baptist, and who follows that was Yeshua. That's interesting. Elijah, curing leprosy, that's a tough one to do. That's a tough miracle. Only three people do it. Okay? And this is really cool. You know, who, Moses, we know he, got, he did that leprosy. Remember, he put his hand in, it came out, it was all lepro, leprous, and then he put it back in, and it came out, and it was healed. But who else of Moses, around Moses, got leprosy? His sister Miriam. Do you know why she got mir- uh, leprosy? He took a bride from, where was she from? from that's good. From Ethiopia, Cush is what the Bible says, but that's Ethiopia. And if, if, it's, she's a black woman. So Moses took a black wife, and she was all over him for doing that, and God punished her by turning her white. Is that funny? <laughs> I love it. Love it. What a sense of humor. Okay. Yeah. Remember I had that chart at the beginning of all the parallels between Moses and Jesus? The curing leprosy was on that chart, but I had to stick an Elisha in there because he did a leper, a leper healing. Uh, number 12. Ah, this is the axe. Uh, a, a guy was chopping a tree, and the axe head f- flew off and went into the water and sunk. And he said, oh, my goodness, uh, Elisha, uh, this was a borrowed tool. And now it fell off, and it's in the water, and I got to... Uh, and Elisha made the axe head float. And you'll notice the axe head floating, all of these miracles that Elisha did, you can parallel them with Jesus' miracles. A floating axe head, it's on the same vein as walking on water. You understand? It's not exactly, but it's things that shouldn't be floating are floating. Okay? Okay. Ah, yeah, this is when Elisha is in his tent working on something, and the, the king sent, the king is upset, the king, uh, because everything that the king was planning, the Jews seemed to find out a, about it ahead of time. And he said, how, how is this? It's almost as if uh, uh, Elisha has spies in my chamber listening in on our plans. Uh, well, I think one of his advisors said, yeah, it's Elisha. He, he, he's got the word. And, and he said, I want you to go find this guy and get him. So they send their army, and they surround Elisha. And Elisha has his assistant with him. And uh, the assistant goes outside and goes, Elijah, Elisha, we are surrounded by the king's army. And Elisha's, I can just see him. He's kind of like working on when he goes, oh, don't worry. <laughs> you know, he's not even phased by it. We're surrounded. And Elisha says, God, let my assistant see what I know is there. That's very cool. And when he went back out and looked, there were chariots of fire and horsemen of fire, and the army was surrounded by God's army, you know. And we should pray that God open our eyes so that we can see what you've got. And we're not going to be worried and, and, you know, because it's there. We just need to recognize it and claim it. All right. Uh, so that's 13, that he opened the eyes of the servant. Um, and here we have Jesus opening eyes. Now, I told you, every, every Elisha miracle is going to be kind of duplicated on some level with Jesus. 14, uh, they came down, uh, Elisha struck, 
Yeah, all that army that was surrounded, Elisha blinded them all. So that's miracle 14. Next. And then once they took that blinded army back to Samaria, <coughs> he had their eyes opened up again. So there's miracle 15 for Elisha. And then 2 Kings 13, Elisha died and was buried, and Moabite, Moabite raiders used to come into the land every spring. And that's Elisha's life. He's, he's gone. He's dead. And uh, that's kind of it. And you know what? It's, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's one more. One more? Nah. There's a fi- he asked for a double portion. Elijah did eight. Right. Elisha did 15. Right. He almost got a double portion. Yes. He restored the sight to the people he blinded. He blinded them and took them to Samaria and then restored their sight. And when he restored their sight, you know what he did? He gave them food. He fed them. This is a picture of Jesus. And we saw it even back whenever Elisha was called. He took all the animals and sacrificed them and he fed the people. Versus Elijah, who just did a sacrifice and everything burns up. Okay? Wasn't there, Jesus is walking along with his people, and somebody cursed him or something, and one of the apostles or disciples said, you want me to call down fire on them? He's referring to what Elisha, you know, or Elijah, calling down fire. The, the, the disciple was in the mindset of Elijah. And Jesus said, no, 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 don't call fire down on them. Elisha would not call fire down on anybody. Elisha just blinded them, and then he restored their sight and gave them food. You can see the difference between Elijah and Elisha? Okay, next. What am I hitting? Is there something it's upside down anyway? I just make sure it's not Yahweh's name and I'm back. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, yeah, these are just the parallels between them. Yeah, see, Elijah, he burns up everything. He feeds the people with his. Number six. Yeah, we'll go back. Number six and seven, yeah. Number six, Elijah calls down fire on the 50 people when they're all, and he does it twice. Jesus, uh, when the disciples said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down and consume them? And he turned them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. There's a difference between what Elisha and Elijah does. Next. Um, we got to get jump ahead here. Jump, jump, jump. Right there. Right back. Back. Too late. We're not going to worry about it. Here it is. Here's what happened. We, we know he, he, Elijah did eight. Elisha did 15 and plots. And so now... Yep. So he does... 15 and then dies and you think oh he mate was that close as maxwell smart would say missed it by that much but and elisha died and they buried him and now the moabite raiders used to come into the land every spring once as the israelites were burying a man suddenly they saw a band of raiders so they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb, and when he touched the bones of Elisha, the man revived and stood up on his feet. That's, uh, he, they put a dead man, touches Elisha's dead bones, and the dead man comes to life. That's miracle 16. Elijah did eight. Elisha did 16. Elisha got a double spirit. Thank you, God. Thank you for letting us know the difference between Elijah and Elisha. Be with us and just continue to bless us and thank you. And we ask in Yeshua's name and we ask that you also bless this food that we are about to eat. 
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. I got a... To the internet, we thank you for joining us for our Shabbat services this week, and we hope you have a very, very wonderful Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>